Okay, so welcome, Jasmine. This is my beautiful niece. I'm allowed to say that, eh? Yes. She's not just some random amazing musician. She she's related to me. <laughs> um, so gotta put that out there. <laughs> Um, so yeah, one of the, my, but I have to just say one of my favorite people in the world, welcome and thank you for coming and talking today. Um, so Jasmine, I guess where is a good place to start? Where, where would you like to start? We're talking about your song that you created for this show and, um, yeah, and I guess it's kind of it's it's obviously for the show and for the purpose of the show, but it was based on personal experience. And I just wonder if you wanted to talk about what that personal experience was. Start wherever you feel you want Definitely. to. Definitely. Um. So first of all, I want to say um how how happy I am to be here, and I'm so you know, proud of your work and, and the podcast that, that you're starting because I know how uh, impactful and helpful this is going to be for people. Um, I have admired your work for such a long time and there is a personal story with that that I'll get into later. But um, yeah, so so when you asked me, I was I just felt really privileged just to start with that you asked me and you really believed in my music to create a theme song and I had the line for it that the main line that you've actually decided to use in your intro you know right from the start you know I had the thought I need you to save me from the dark I need your help the song was inspired by um, first of all what I know your organization does for people and what it did for me um, when I had first had uh, my first daughter and I struggled with postnatal depression um, so I used uh, the lyrics in the song to um, express some of those memories and some of that that um, pain and and the things that I wanted the most so for example I talk about you know I'm chasing clarity to see beauty again you know and I need your help um, to get out of this dark place that was basically um, where I wrote the song from it was really hard to first of all even identify that I had problems mm -hmm. you know that I really had so a serious problem because I'd always been such a happy and positive minded person at least that's the way I thought of myself so I mean it doesn't mean that all times were positive but in general my self-image was I'm happy I'm positive you know I see the world in a like you know sparkly and glittery sort of way and so when I really started struggling with um with really depressive thoughts and emotions it was mostly just like a heavy cloud and a heavy fog that was over my mind which um I really loved that you named this out of the fog because it's so is the real experience that you have where you're trying to you know push out of an experience that you're kind of not used to feeling your brain is overwhelmed with how bad and and how dark you kind of feel inside mm. um you know so for me it was like I got that help to get out of the fog I got it from um so first of all um I was listening to you do a live so very similar to like I think how your podcasts will reach people so Sorry. no 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 I was just gonna ask you I was actually just trying to think I was just thinking I was trying to remember back because of course we'll we'll jump to this bit because you came to stay with me but yeah. I was thinking how did it all begin like did we I'm trying to remember because it was quite a long time ago you know um Alina is now seven so, yes, seven. she just turned seven. Seven, that's right. Um, <laughs> Did she? I'm, well, I'm, her, I'm like, I felt I felt bad for a second there. I was like, I should know how old she is. Anyway, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and so I'm trying to remember, did you, you, you know, where did the conversation with me start? Because I can't yeah. remember. Yeah. Like I, did we sit down at a cafe? Did we have a conversation over the phone? Do you remember? I do. I do remember. Okay. So, so what happened was, um, you were doing a live video, um, about postnatal depression and you shared like a special test and I can't remember the name of it. What, what was that test called? It's called the Edinburgh test. We'll put it, we'll put that test in the um, show notes so other people can do that too. 
that was a lifesaver because um so I uh, so you were doing a live and you were talking about like um, symptoms of depression and you were specifically sharing some of your story about postnatal depression. I remember you saying in it that you hated doing lives and and that you never <laughs> <laughs> and that you never did them because you felt so uncomfortable. And then you went on to share a whole lot of information that was like I was listening to it. I think I was six months. No. Um, I was probably nine months into having Alina and I had been feeling this way for about three months at least, if not more, like kind of growing slowly where I was feeling really desperate and really low, you know, just really feeling exhausted. I would battled a lot of sickness um, of like um, the, the breast infections that you get, mastitis. I was always trying to live up to these expectations of either my mum or who's, who is amazing. She's genuinely amazing. Um, or, um, just, um, you know, expectations of a young husband who also had no idea what being a mum or having a baby looked like and why was the house a mess, you know, kind of questions, you know, oh, why can't you go back to the gym? You know, like just things that, um, it really deeply impacted me because I thought, yeah, why can't I, you know, I saw other people being able to do it and then I would try it. And I would get so sick for, I would just get so sick. And it kind of happened again and again and again until um, basically I was like, I am so depressed. I could feel it. I was so depressed. I felt just crazy with the, with how low I felt and frustrated at, at not being able to kind of move forward in life. I was stuck, just stuck with either, you know, sickness or, you know, kind of un met expectations from people in my life or you know and I was very isolated at the time too I lived um, quite far away from people and I hadn't quite got my license I was um, in my early 20s a young mum and <laughs> I just hadn't got my license so you know it was amazing when I did that did really help but but what um, so to get back to your question about like how did it all really start so I was listening to this live and you explained these similar kind of experiences of how you know how you get so low and um and fall into depression and postnatal depression and what you know the symptoms of that and um and then you shared the test and I did the test and I thought I was being so secretive I was like she will not know my email address <laughs> she'll not know my email address like this is um anonymous or something <laughs> and so I did the test and then um and then you reached out to me in an email and said hey I just um noticed that you were really like you know your score is not good it's really bad and I just would love to talk with you about it some more because you said you know you've you have always just hoped that no one else in our family would go through that. So I was kind of sad to be like that one, but, but at the same time I was, I, at first I was like, oh my gosh, she found me. She knew it was me, you know? And, and I was a bit like, oh my gosh. But at the same time, like that was such a significant moment because it, it um, opened up an entire avenue of help that I didn't know that I needed at the time. I had no idea, you know, and I didn't, employ self-care I just didn't I was constantly pushing to try and fulfill other people's needs you know I mean obviously you've got a baby who's desperate for everything you know because yeah. they're a baby you know but even my husband and um learning how to put like put things in place that meant that I actually had some kind of breather in my soul where my soul was actually happy and enjoying life that wasn't something I was trying to do at all at the time yeah there's there's a lot of um expectations we actually um since you uh, since way back then I've developed a program called parent uh, preparing for parenthood and we talk a lot about expectations because those expectations can lead to depression and anxiety because often they're unrealistic. We have this, before we become a parent, we have really unrealistic expectations about what it's all going to be like. Mm -hmm. And we've also got, we kind of carry this internal view of what an ideal mum is and what kind of mum we want to be. And we all carry, and it's all different for everyone. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's, 
um, we've seen it, like we've, we've seen it modeled to us and we're trying to be like someone else um, sometimes. And, and we think, well, that's what people expect. That's what a good mum is. Mm. Um, and a good mum is sacri sacrifices and a good mum always does the housework and a good mm. mum always is there for everyone else. And, it, and it's like we have these internal expectations, but then we also have external expectations from other people um and in the preparing for parenthood course we talk about that we get couples together and talk about well, what's your expectation of becoming a parent and, and what about of your spouse mm -hmm. because it's it can be a huge issue that's not even necessarily spoken about but it mm -hmm. creates huge internal and external conflict mm -hmm. and um every time I've ever worked with mums they're always battling those expectations whether they're internal or external mm -hmm. expectations mm -hmm. yeah it was it was so amazing um when so first of all I I did come to stay with you and basically had what amounts to one-on-one -on -one counseling even though it wasn't mm -hmm. like official but you know we talked a lot about all of the the things that were in your book and you gave me your workbook um, and I started working towards, um, like I read all the nutrition things and I remember like happily, like going down the road to buy myself cheese and like things that had vitamin D in them and finding things with vitamin B and, you know, like increasing the things that were probably lacking, but I also completely got rid of expectations and, um, expectations that were placed on me and tried to think about what my body needed in the moment. So, um, you know, if I needed, you know, that whole sleep when baby sleeps thing. And, yeah. and there's so much pressure to not do that because mm. when are you ever going to get anything done? Yeah. And I tell you the second baby I had, I didn't get postnatal depression. And one of the things that I said straight at the very beginning was, um, to my husband, I said, the house is going to be a bomb site for a year and I don't care and I'm not going to clean it. And I'm, and I'm going to go out and have, and it sounds so ruthless, you know, but, but it was actually the best decision I made. And I even was better at the housework and about everything, just even for my own self, because I took time away and I got rid of the horrible expectations that I had to get these things done in the day. Otherwise, you know, my, I was failing at, you know, I was like, it is actually the most horrible thing. You kind of realize this after you've, after you've at least lived through one year is that it is one of the hardest years because you're so tired and you're so, um, your body is under a lot. It's healing from having had a baby. It's, you know, maybe in my case, producing milk still, which really took a huge toll on my, on my babies. You know, some people have trouble where they can't produce milk. And then there's the whole thing where I produced so much milk that I would get blocked ducts all the time, yeah. you know, and so I get really sick. And, and I feel like, you know, all the mums that I've ever spoken to, there's always something that is really challenging yeah. that it, it, whether you're you know, at work and you're really missing your kids or whether you're stuck at home, mm -hmm. you know, and I've kind of done bits and both, bits and both, <laughs> bits and bobs of both things. And, and they're both really hard, you know, missing yeah. the kids or being stuck at home in isolation. If you don't look yeah. after yourself and make sure that you go and you see people and you get away from the dishes, you know, and the, so I would do things the second time round, and I started doing this at the very end of, um, you know, some of the things that helped me get out, um, of just the darkness that I was in was, you know, going on walks, but not like I'm going to get fit walks. They were like, I'm strolling along and staring at the beautiful green grass, you know, and the sky. And yeah. yeah. And, um, it was things like, um, going and feeding the baby at the park instead of sitting there with my mound of dirty washing or my mound of clean washing. And I had both mounds always. <laughs> I always had both mounds. I kind of still do. Um, <laughs> but you know, it's just like, what, what, um, do you really want out of life? That was part of what the book sort of got you thinking about is like, what are your goals? You know, what brings you, um, peace and joy and hope and everything for the future and then just going for those things and I mean I'm I'm a musician I'm an artist and I'm I'm now creating and producing music which I've been growing into 
um, over the past wee while. And I use those same goals that I learned, that same mindset of, you know, what is the most important thing right now? How do I prioritize it? What expectations do I need to let go of mm. that are um, not in my hands to to deal with right now? You know, I'm working on a project and I'm loving the project. The whole house is a bomb site, you know, but that's not my, that's not an expectation I can fulfill right now. And I can deal with that after. So like in my mind, kind of giving myself space to, um, to choose things that, that that are important or the most important or also you know core to who I am as a person so like not letting go of who you are that was another thing that I definitely let go of um in that first year so I'm just thinking that um you know just for the purpose of people listening they're thinking well what is this workbook and I just wanted Um, to yeah just to pause and say well um so Jasmine got Jasmine got um the out of the fog program Uh, We run through Mother's Helpers in New Zealand only. Um, uh, It's a group therapy program. It's it's designed to be ideally in group therapy or individual therapy. Um, And Jasmine didn't really want to do that. (laughs) So because she's my niece, she got got to have, she got to read it and sort of do it at her own pace. Um, That's right. I forgot that I had special treatment. On she that. did. She had special <laughs> treatment. She did. And the other thing was as well. Um, I'll just to say also say that I, even though that program is only available uh, to women in New Zealand through group group therapy or individual therapy. I do have training available online so that anyone anywhere in the world can train in in it and then deliver that program, um, whether they want to do it group therapy or individual therapy. And one thing I will say about that program is that um, the the we've we've got a really steady um, statistic. That is that seventy six percent of um, women or mothers going through the program were well by the end of the program, and had a fifty two percent reduction in their Edinburgh scores, which um, was the score that Jasmine was talking about before. Um, and in the last year, that rose to ninety percent well by the end of the program so it's a really really effective program which is why I really encourage therapists and clinicians to train in it and to deliver it so yeah I just wanted to to mention that yeah 100% I I feel like um, of all the things that I've read surrounding mental health your book is so practical that's that's actually what is the real gold you know, within it is just that it is so easy to put into practice. So it kind of covers, you know, medication. What is medication? Why would you need it? You know, it it gives you a whole lot of, um, would you call them natural things or like the kind of natural alternatives? alternatives. Well, it actually is basically a holistic. It's what you call a holistic approach, isn't it? Because it, um, it examines like, you know, diet and um, getting some movement and exercise into into your life, you know, in a sustainable way and in like a, a sort of incrementally. I remember it being kind of like you set little goals and then you set another little goal. And, um, and that was so powerful. That was so powerful because it was so easy to do it that way instead of being like, oh, I have to be able to climb Mount Everest tomorrow and be back into the physical peak shape that I was pre-children you know which is kind of what I I had in my mind I don't know how many other women have that but I do know it's it's such a a struggle for all of us whether you've got a completely unrealistic goal or not it's such a struggle to have to think I have to achieve you know being fit again you know back to my pre-pregnancy self that's a common like struggle I have to yeah an expectation I have to um you know keep the house clean keep the kids like looking like little cherubs that walked off the the oh baby magazine Mm -hmm. and I have to you know no one does that all the time and I saw this really hilarious meme once where it said um 
you know, the house can be clean, I can look stunning, or the kids can look amazing, but, you know, it can't be all three of them at once every time. Normally, normally, like, obviously there are incredible people out there that, that juggle it all, but, you know, in my... I haven't met one. <laughs> you haven't met one? <laughs> You know, yeah, I mean, and that is that is actually the truth, isn't it? That like the closer that we actually get to people's lives that you think are, you know, have it all together. I mean, I don't know how many people look at me and think, wow, she's creating music. She's a mum and she's working. How on earth is she doing that? You know, and I've had people even ask me that before. And, and the real answer is, well, the house waits sometimes, yeah. you know. Sometimes, you know, I have to take time out from from the kids and from life. You know, I'll, I'll um, have other people watch them so I can go do things, which is, you know, that's a sacrifice. Um, I don't, <laughs> you know, it's a, it is a sacrifice, and you know, trying to balance and try to keep in keeping in mind what's most important to me is my kids. But mm. you know, having to schedule time. Um, to do things that you love and be the person that you really, really want to be. And I think that's where I was heading with the whole voice note thing ages ago was just, you know, <laughs> who who do you really, really want to be and really going for that goal and not losing it. Oh, the funny thing. No, I, I actually do remember. Um, so for an entire year post baby, not a single creative thought enters your brain. Like it didn't enter mine. I don't know about other people. I'm sure, you know, if you really, like if you tell that baby brain that's like chopping off hunks of your, like, I don't even know. You know how your brain morphs when you actually have babies? Apparently your brain morphs. I don't know if it shrinks, but, <laughs> you know, but but what I what I experienced was that I couldn't actually care or think about anything creative for a whole year until you kind of start getting some sleep again and, and the babies kind of starts being able to like chew their own food without dying and, <laughs> you know, stuff, stuff like that. It's like your brain is in survival mode for, for an entire year. And so, um, yeah. Anyway, that's all I was going to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to uh, say as well that um, you've touched on a couple of things that were quite important to you. So one of them you talked about was living, figuring out your priorities and what was important to you. And that's in the program is working out your values and living by your values. And we talk about that um, a little bit in the program. And the thing that I've seen you grow in the most and that I'm I am always super, super pleased about because it's stuck with you. It's not something that kind of was for a short period of time mm -hmm. during a time that you were struggling. It's mm -hmm. stuck with you is self-care. Mm -hmm. And I've just seen that. And I think I have to say that probably the, the message that most mums come away with with our program is that self-care becomes vital and often they sort of go into the program going there's no way that my needs can be met because it's either either their needs or my needs and my needs have to go in order to meet theirs and so we spend the program kind of saying well it's possible to do both it's it's not easy and you have to be very creative but it's possible yeah. Um, doesn't mean that the housework will necessarily get done or, you know, something, something's going to have to give and yeah. there's going to be compromise, but it, it absolutely is possible. And so generally they walk away with this strong message of self-care is vital and my needs are important too. And that's something that I've noticed with you is that it's sort of not some, it's not negotiable for you. Like there are times where, it's harder to to make it happen, but I've seen you over and over again make it happen. Yes, I recently went through the hardest time that I've had, you know, since I had postnatal depression, really. Um, I was working a, a full-time teaching job um, far, far away from my family, and I had a lot of medical issues. In a lot of ways, it was kind of like the parenting experience because it was like it felt 24-7. It was like, you know, as a teacher, you've got your, your time in the class, you've got time before school that you have to give, you've got 
time basically you know until you go to sleep almost you know a lot of days that you have to give to do planning or marking or whatever um and so yeah I really struggled to find find the the happy place you know and in that place and I did for my mental health as well as for um my physical health and everything I was like well I'm really really missing out on support systems you know that is so key to having great mental health is actually just having friends and family around you that you know love you and care about you you know outside of your workplace of course you can have lovely people in your workplace I'm going to be so grateful forever for the um lovely kind people that did brighten my world while I was up there um you know and I did really get involved in just the loveliest music community but you know it was it's not the same as having your real core support people that um you know can just be there in every thick and thin difficult moment and um so actually just coming back home back closer to family and back you know in a place where life was better that was a huge decision for self care it was like the biggest decision i've ever made to to leave that job early comparative to you know a, a full year as a teacher you know it's quite a big thing and heart wrenching to say okay you know i'm going to leave these kids for the final term and um and I have to put myself and my family first because everybody's suffering. Mm. Um, best decision I've ever made. I am so much happier. Um, but there were a lot of things that were lacking up there that I recognized because of this whole understanding of self-care and what it really is, you know, because I would try very, very hard to implement things like going early in the mornings to go and stare at the sunrise at the beach because we were surrounded by beaches. Like it was visually just like a gourmet experience. It was so beautiful. But, you know, I did realize that all of the other things that that were really important were missing um, for all of us, for all, for our whole family. And um yeah, I'm so, so happy to be closer to people and, um, sorry, people that are, you know, within that I deeply love you support system. You know, you need people in your life that, that deeply love you, but you also just, um, I also took on a relieving, just relief teaching and, um, you know, obviously not everyone can step away from really you know, hardcore full-time jobs. And I do remember having chats with you at the time where you're like, try and find something, you know, I'd have baths. I would bury my head in the baths for like, just to get rid of the classroom noise, you know? Mm. Um, and I would just like stay under there in complete silence. It's like that whole thing where you want to go in a, a dark room and just rock back and forth. That was the vibe I was going for. So <laughs> I think I was pretty much like, please come home yes, yes yeah. you were you were but you're like but if you're going to stay out th up there try these things yeah. and so I mean I did really like I will cherish sort of in a weird way um you know getting up super early and going to see the wild horses on the mm. beach you know like I would try and, and enforce moments that gave me joy mm. and I did start playing at a um an open mic up there and um I really enjoyed that and honestly they were lovely they gave me flowers when I left and and, you know, so there were things that I put into my life and I forced to be there because I was like, I have to have some joy. Mm -hmm. But but the best decision that I ever made for mental health sake, as well as physical health, as well as, you know, my children and just every single possible reason you could think of um, coming home was the yeah. best thing because it was never going to... Um, I guess I, yeah, I arrived at that decision. It was not actually what I wanted out of life. That's what it really boils down to. Like, what are your goals in life? And is this really serving it? Um, and I'm really happy to say that I decided to go hard for what my true, true dreams and goals um, really are for my whole life. It was very um, confronting. <laughs> yeah. And obviously that's been a huge part of your loving life is mm. music and um and I'll come back to that but I just just want to I suppose a, a thing that you've probably heard me say to you many times over the years is that you know if anything costs you your mental health then the cost is too much mm -hmm. 
um, nothing is worth that much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I sort of maintain that. I'd mm -hmm. like someone to give me and give me um a like a good reason a good why reason that why that wouldn't happen <laughs> why that wouldn't be the case but I can't think of any I think that's actually one of the best quotes that's like a full-on Christina quote that I have carried with me all these years as well actually